Afrique Midi. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello, thanks for joining us on your Pan African Television. This is Afrique Media. So it's a pleasure uh, being with you, and today we are here to discuss again what is making headline news around the African continent. Our interest, of course, is uh, what concerns Africa, what affects Africa, and uh, we'll be here to discuss uh, on the security situation in the Sahel region, and we'll be discussing on the military pact between uh, signed uh, between uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger in the fight against uh, insecurity uh, in the region. Uh, noting that on uh, September 16, 2023, in, Bo in Bamako, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger established an alliance of uh, Sahel states in mutual defense pact. The agreement was signed against the backdrop of an ongoing political crisis in Niger following a coup on uh, July 26, 2023. The regional bloc, the Economic Community of West African States, that's ECOWAS, straightened uh, military intervention. The alliance was set up to help counter possible threats of armed rebellion or external aggression, according to the member states. And we were finding out what this alliance will mean, and if it's at all, it's just an alliance created to fight against France in the region. However, the different bodies and mechanisms of the alliance are yet to be created. Uh, the Sahel region has been facing a jihadist insurgency since the early 2000s. The situation has triggered many uh, other conflicts in the region, war in Mali and insurgency in Burkina Faso. The member states of the military alliance have experienced military uh, coups in recent years. Uh, leading to a deterioration of their relations with the rest of ECOWAS and as well as uh, France. Stay with us as we be discussing uh, on this situation in the Sahel region. It's on views on the continent. <laughs> Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali established a military alliance on uh, September 16, 2023. This is in a bid to fight against insurgency and rebellion in the region. What does this mean and what impact would this have in the fight against insurgency uh, and insecurity in the Sahel region? Um, this is coming equally at a time when the relations between uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger uh, are deteriorating with uh, via former colonial master France. We will be discussing uh, the impact of the military alliance and what this means. To many, I believe it's just uh, an alliance created to fight against uh, the presence of or influence of France in the region. But then we shall be discussing that this day on the program. We are delighted to be with you. And don't forget, we shall be getting to uh, hear from you. You can always leave us your comments. Those of you who be watching us live, we shall give us uh, give you time to call and share your opinions and your thoughts uh, with regards to the topic with us this day. And uh, to discuss this topic, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ambi Valentine. He is a political and economic consultant. Dr. Ambi, it's a pleasure having you on Afric Media this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Luis. Thank you, viewers of Afric Media. Welcome to Views on the Continent, uh, today's edition. And um, I'm delighted to be back in the country after a moment stay in Europe. It's been yeah. a long, and uh, I know viewers have been asking questions, where yeah. has the doctor been? Yeah. I've been on a mission trip to Europe, and I just came back, and uh, very excited to be here again today. Yeah, each time uh, you visit Europe and come back to Africa, there's always a difference in the feeling, difference in the developments, difference in the way you look at the world. It is, of course, a different perspective. Uh, tell us a little about the feeling out there with regards <laughs> to Africa. Africa is home, but then what of you course. see out there is motivating. Sometimes you're discouraged with what is happening back in Africa with regards to the level of development, even though we have all what it takes to be better and uh, <coughs> to be like them. Yeah, Luis. <coughs> yeah, sure. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Luis. Uh, <coughs> it's a whole <coughs> learning process. Yeah. You know, my father told me once that the easiest way to study is to travel. Mm -hmm. And once you travel, your perspective changes. I've realized that Africa is rich yeah. in terms of resources, but Europe is rich mentally. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, big, that's <laughs> a big one. Yes, that, that's one thing that we yeah. have been hammering over and over. Africa is rich. Africa is rich. Africa is rich in what? Mm. Africa is rich in resources. 
Europe is rich mentally. mentally. And you know it is a mentor that controls the resources. Mm. It is humans that give value. Human resource that give value to material resource. So if there is no human resource, there is no material. There is no value for material resource. Wow. So the reason why you see Europe seems to be big because Europe has human resource. Africa has material resource, mm. and because human resource control material resource, mm. that's why you see Europe always control Africa. Okay. That's where the the nuance is when we talk about riches because every time we come on television we say Africa is rich Africa is rich Africa is rich Africa is rich rich in what because yeah. the word rich is not some kind of a singular term that is addressed to a particular thing it's mm. diversified you could be rich in mental uh, mentally and not you are not rich materially okay. you can be rich materially and not rich mentally so I now understand why there is some kind of development in Europe why it's not in Africa Africa is rich in something mm-hmm. and that thing that is rich in is not what Europe is rich in. Yeah. For instance, the Europeans, I believe, don't have money. But the little they have, the way they manage it, will make you think they have so much. Mm-hmm. The problem with Africa is not actually m- absence of resources or absence of finances. It's absence of managers. Yeah. Money does not go through the hands of Europeans the way it goes through the hands of Africans. That's the reason why there's so much corruption here. Because money mm-hmm. goes through through the hands through the of hands individuals. Of, yeah. yeah, there there are systems put in place that the bus driver does not touch money, mm-hmm. the train driver does not touch money, those who are working in the tax office do, do, do not touch money. Mm-hmm. Money is paid through cash and it lands in the central system, but it goes through several hands here in Africa before it reaches the final destination. It's almost crumbs or nickels or dimes remaining. Just to imagine the, the, the amount of cash that was discovered in the, <laughs> in the house of, in the house of uh, in Gabonese, Gabonese uh, <laughs> President's <laughs> Associate. It's unfortunate. <laughs> well, uh, thanks very much for honoring the invitation, Dr. Ami Valentine. And today we're focusing on the military alliance between Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. But just in time, let's uh, try to welcome Kikilomo Shodeko, who is currently a RICS and security expert. Kikilomo, it's a pleasure having you if you're there. Uh, okay, I think I'm here. Can you oh. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, am I properly positioned yeah. for the video? Yeah, sure. We, we, we're good okay, to go. Perfect. Yeah, thanks so very much for honoring the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for being late. I was really late. I apologize. Okay, thanks very much for, for being there. Uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Mevalentine, we're talking about the uh, military alliance b- between Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. And this is coming at a time when we, we, we're seeing uh, relations between uh, the these countries deteriorating with regards to their former colony, uh, France. Um, yes, how do you see this military alliance? You know, I'd like to begin by saying that in 2017, France, Germany, and the European Union formed the G5 alliance. Yeah. The purpose of the alliance was for security purposes, economic growth, social amenities, as well as infrastructural development mm-hmm. in 2017. That was when Timbuktu, the ancient city of Mali, was greatly hit by Al Qaeda and ISIS and the Amr Rasul and Al Murabitum pressure groups or terrorist groups, as coined by the Europeans. Yeah. And then we thought that G5 alliance was supposed to serve the purpose, but we realized that things even got worse. They got worse that the situation in Mali spilled over to Burkina Faso as well as neighboring countries. Mm. And because of that, we thought that the G5 side alliance was supposed to have served the purpose to curb down the situation and the insecurities, Mm. but things rather grew worse. Now, uh, 16th of September, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger yeah, yeah. signed this pact for security reasons. Mm-hmm. I want to believe that a lot of things are on ground, and that's the reason why these three nations came together. Mm-hmm. Remember when French insisted not to remove its soldiers out of Niger, and insisted not to remove its ambassador out of Niger, and uh, ECOWAS threatened to confront Niger, Burkina Faso and Mali, without signing this pact, had already shown interest that in any case, yeah. if ECOWAS who dare to step into Niger using a military approach to restore Bazoum back to power, mm-hmm. then Burkina Faso and uh, Niger, uh, Mali will definitely join Niger to fight out any intervention, intervention in mm-hmm. that, re- that country. Mm-hmm. This is just to let you understand that 
what they said initially was illegal because there was no pact yeah they've gone now to legalize it it's like somebody who is driving quite all right but doesn't have a license okay so when he drives he can be arrested by the law so he goes now to do a license in order to have that legal like, backing yeah. that he has a right to ply the roads with vehicle. Mm -hmm. So this pact to me is legalizing the intentions they had earlier okay. to protect the interests of one another. This is because these three countries, according to international law, are walking out of the codes and the protocols of international law. They rose to power without a democratic process. Mm -hmm. They ousted presidents and became presidents. And because of this, they are considered as clandestine government by the international community. And because of that, they are also using an iron fist to secure their position in power, and no individual can fight. To me, it makes sense because that joint alliance empowers them to be able to face from all fronts. Number two, Africa has been agitating for a united Africa, and one of the desires of Africans is being, has been the intention to set up a singular army okay. an army that can stand to defend the interest of africa i okay. think these three guys from these three nations are beginning to communicate something in the continent africa because you realize this alliance is going to give them security from all angles you cannot attack burkina faso through niger you cannot attack mali through niger you cannot attack niger through burkina faso you discover that everybody is watching everyone's back and this makes it more stronger the reason why countries in africa were invaded like mali and um, libya and the persons like Gaddafi were killed mm -hmm. was because there was nobody to defend them. The surrounding countries did not give them the defense that they needed. Mm -hmm. Now look at what has happened between Palestine and Israel. Egypt has blocked its borders and has refused to give the necessary support that Palestine needs. Yeah. That tells you that if the countries around you are collaborating with you, it secures you. And I believe they are sending a message across the continent Africa so that the rest of the countries who think that living in isolation is a better way of living is not the best because to them, I think this time around, you cannot just create easily walk over the army of three nations, okay. Burkina Faso, Niger, and then Mali. Mali. Okay. But you could do that if Mali was alone. Mm. You could do that if Burkina Faso was alone. So it becomes very difficult and stiff. And then especially for their fr French, col their former colonial master who is mm -hmm. France, that has threatened in Burkina Faso to conduct a coup d'etat. I think this is very, very serious for them to understand that the battle is not yet over. Okay. And France has refused to oust its army from Niger as well as its ambassador. All right. To date. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that. Kiki uh, Lomoshideko, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger are forming a military alliance, leaving behind uh, ECOWAS as well as uh, the G5 Sahel. What does this mean to you and what does this mean to the, the fight against insecurity uh, in the region? Um, I, I always say that um, I'm one for collaboration. I've always been and I always will be because I believe you can't live in isolation. You never can. You won't survive it. Um, the fact that what we see ongoing today in the world is that some people have good backing while others have bad backing, if we can put it like that, or non-advantageous backing. So if you have the right kind of backing, it helps your um, uh, how you are able to combat your surrounding enemies, as the case may be. And as we know, no matter how uh, we try to lie to ourselves on a regular basis, um, Countries have to face a lot of ups and downs, especially in the, as the world goes far. Uh, people are trying to make a lot of money, but at the same time, they are trying to secure um, their lives, the, the lives of their people, secure their borders, and as it is. So I'll put it in context. Um, something happened in Ukraine, but Ukrainian people are not called refugees, right? They have embedded themselves back into European society because European doors are open. That's good backing. That means that they have people that have got their backs. Now, I'll bring it back to the context of what um, those three areas, which is which has for a long time uh, battled a lot of terrorism. What they are doing makes a lot of sense. Yes, it is good to have an allegiance, to have a pact, and the pact is supposed to help in the long run um, with... The, the battle against the terrorists, right? Or the battle against any kind of outside opposition. 
as good as it sounds, we know how our leaders are. It makes sense to do this. In fact, we don't just need this pact in Burkina Faso and Nigeria, Mali. We need it to spread across the whole of West Africa. Because when the pact is really good, we are able to help one another. And we can, at the end of the day, eradicate terrorism. I believe that wholeheartedly. But the problem with this move is not really a move that is supposed to be advantageous to the people in the long run. I will always say that the pact is good. The idea behind it is great. In fact, I support it 100%. But why um, is this happening? It's more of internal opposition, not actually external opposition. Because now, at this stage they are in, if you are doing a pact, it means that if you oppose the government, for example, and you decide that, okay, you know what? <laughs> it's getting hot for me to stay, for example, in Niger because I'm against the government. For good reason, if I will say that. But the moment you step out of Niger thinking you can run into Burkina or Mali, there are people already waiting to <laughs> extradite you back to your country, you know, to face the wrath of the military, right? Um, I apologize for smiling because uh, I, I always process whatever um, we are trying to do as a people. I always process the whys, right? Yes, maybe the why is to make sure that we don't have former colonial masters trying to infiltrate back into the country and making sure that all the measures are in place to make sure that there is no return, right? Make sure that maybe they are trying to curb terrorism in a way, you know, and all those things. But I always see it from the other side. As far as this pact is concerned, are there standards and measures? What are the measure? What's the measurement that the pact is good? So for example, um, uh, whatever we are describing where a terrorist situation has happened in the, there's a, the, there's a place we call the three zones in this area. And that zone is a desert area where the terrorists seem to have a lot of clout or a lot of opportunity to do their, their horrible things. Now, the question is with this pact, are we going to see a reduction in those types of incidents? Or this is a pact on paper only, just to threaten any outside uh, person to know that, no, you can't mess with these three countries now because they have a pact, right? There should be a measure. And this is what I'm saying. So, for example, Ukraine got into trouble with Russia. And the next thing, they have a, the, the, the pact that they have with other European countries came, came and worked for them because they were able to move them out of Ukraine. And they're able to spread in Europe without issues, right? Same goes for Israel with the with the with the fight with Israel and Palestine and all those problems happening in that area. You have the American government, you know, making sure that Israel knows that they've got their back, you know, things like that. So there is a measurement. So you, I can, Israel cannot tell us now that oh, we have a pact with the U.S. and when this kind of situation is happening, U.S. says, oh, sorry, I can't get involved in this kind of fight. It's between you and Palestine. Or when the problem started with Ukraine. They say, oh, sorry, we can't take you into the other European countries. Now, with this one, with this, with this type of incident, we need to be able to measure it. So what are these governments? What is their measure? Are we saying that by, let's say, in the next two months, we've been able to infiltrate most of these terrorist outfits in this area? We've been able to curb that and return civilian life back into those areas. So that, for me, is the measure of the pact. But if the pact is really just a flex of power, paperwork, and just to make maybe France be threatened, I can tell you that um, the people that want to do evil, they don't need this kind of threats. As long as they have access to power, they will always go to power to get it, right? Uh, so that's how I view this whole thing. So on one side, it's a perfect, makes sense. In fact, it should not just be um, amongst these three countries. It should extend all the way down to our side in Nigeria here all the way to all the way down to the other parts of West Africa that are going through the, the issue with terrorism and jihadists, right? Great idea. We should expand it, make sure that we have military pacts that, you know, transcends, which already kind of exists, right? With the ECOWAS and things like that, right? But if this pact is just for paperwork and the same terrorist incidents are still happening, civilians can go about their businesses, they can't really do much even in those areas that they claim they have packed over to make sure that these infiltrations reduce. And maybe they even say France should not be able to come in again and still some French people still have access to the government. Then I think that's just a waste of their time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thanks very much, Kiki Lumu. And she highlights that the park is a good initiative and should expand, just like you, if you call it, mentioned that it's a good initiative. But Mr. Uh, Dr. Mr. Valentine, this park is being formed by what many say um, are illegitimate governments or military governments. What do you think uh, this means? And uh, what's the sustainability? Now, we're talking about expansion of the park. Uh, will it be welcomed by maybe democratic governments and what will it mean if we have to expand it just like you highlighted? Would there be some setbacks with regards to the pact being started by military governments? Yeah, um, it's considered illegitimate on one front and legitimate on the other front. The legitimacy of, the go of, a, of any government is based on the people, mm -hmm. usually okay. based on outsiders. Mm. I think if a government is legitimate, it is a people of that government, of that country, that can endorse a government or say a government is not legitimate. But, but there are always the, oppositions, those who believe that... Uh, of course, but if you look at it critically, it has turned out to, sh to prove that the Malians, the Nigerians, the Burkina Bays are so much in support of the, the military takeover and the mm. governments that are in power. That's mm. the reason why you will not find the kind of tension you will find in a democratic country where the people do not accept the government. Mm. So I think what is the democracy in this sense? Democracy is when the people accept the government. But, but to Kiki Lume, she believes that the voices of the opposition are suppressed by the military since uh, they have the guns or they use the barrel. Nowhere on earth is the opposition not suppressed. Whether it is democratic system, you are in Cameroon. Do we have a military government in Cameroon? Mm -hmm. Does the opposition have a voice? They are surprised. Go to other countries. It's the same. Mm -hmm. So we should not uh, like try to lay emphasis that because these guys are military guys have subdued the governments of their country. Mm -hmm. No. If you look at it critically, the population of those nations, the three nations in question, are fully in support. For instance, much of the people, or, or many people in those countries, always speak well about the government. And they are very comfortable with what the government is doing so far. So I believe that in the actual democracy is when the people actually accept the government. Whether the government came to a military system or it came to a democratic election, it is what the people accept that is called democracy. So to me, I believe that these countries are highly uh, respected by their citizens and the government in question is accepted by the people. Now, coming back to the alliance, the pact that they have signed, uh, the, it has its own shortcomings, that is to say, for like what uh, Kikalamo said. Sometimes it will help these guys to stay in power for too long because each and everyone will be there to protect the interest of each and everyone. So if somebody rises tomorrow to confront the power in Burkina Faso and he's threatened, he escapes to Mali, they will send him back to Burkina Faso. He escapes to Niger, they will send him back because the, part, the, the presidents in question are in an alliance. And escaping to will not be possible. It will not be possible because you are only running into the net of another person who is in support of the person you are running away from. So those are some of the disadvantages. But I think that the interest of this pact is to defend the infiltration of France because nobody will twist this. These things only came up as a result of France's threats. France's threats, I beg your pardon. As a result of France's threat that... Uh, they will not leave Niger, and also the threat from ECOWAS that they will use a military approach. Whereas the days are going by, ECOWAS interest of a military approach is gradually dying. It is going out of, 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 of order. And that's the reason why I believe these guys, their primary enemy right now happens to be France that they dislodge out of their country. And they are doing this pact is to protect themselves from the infiltration of France. And France will never come back into this country as France. France will come back as Africans in that same country. They will come back through other groups that they have raised to confront this country. So this country, I believe they are watching their borders and they are building internal security to make sure that nobody becomes a betrayer to the other. For instance, what happened was when the military forces were driven, France military forces were driven from Niger, from Burkina Faso, they took refuge in Niger, which was a danger. Because you cannot send people out of Mali, then they move to Niger. They are at the border of Mali. That's a close range, and that's exactly what Putin is fighting today. NATO coming close to Ukraine is a danger to them. So removing military forces from Mali down to Niger is equally a threat. So it becomes a neighbor. Now like this, that they have kicked out France's forces from 
France's forces from uh, French forces they were combining from Mali and they have gone to Niger and Niger equally is ousting them. You realize that Mali now is more secured, Burkina Faso is more secure because the parties that are close to each other do not have the enemy by themselves. France, uh, um, Niger, Niger does not have uh, 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 French forces in their country to monitor Mali or to monitor Burkina Faso. Neither does Burkina Faso have French forces in their country to monitor Niger. So I think they are trying to protect each other by signing this pact to make sure that you watch my back, I watch your back, because you can enter Niger through Burkina Faso and you can enter Mali through Niger. And so these, these countries are a stretch. They fall within the same environment. That's the reason what affects Mali sometimes enters into Burkina Faso. And what sometimes affects Burkina Faso enters into Niger. So these countries realize that they are in a circle and a particular environment. This has pushed them to sign this pact so that they can defend themselves. Now, the internal security and the external security are two different things they are approaching here. The external security has to do with the invasion of France's terrorist groups. And equal the internal security has to do with the betrayers inside the system of the government. And they must protect it because the battle is not yet over. You know, when you come to power through a coup d'etat, it becomes very dangerous because your life is on a balance. At any time, you can be ousted. That's exactly what happened in Niger. When uh, Bubaka Keita was kicked out of power, Bando was brought to power. And Bando began messing up. They kicked him again out of power. So once you come through coup d'etat in power, you have to be watching front and back to make sure that nobody penetrates the system. And I think these guys are signing this pact to make it legitimate from the level of their own association. They can be legitimate without necessarily being part of the ECOWAS. Because the legitimacy of the country or the sovereignty of the country is not based on the block it is tied to. It is based on the independence and the rules of the, the laws that govern that country. Is Burkina Faso independent? Yes. Do they have a structure? Yes. Do they have an administration? Yes. Do they have a parliament? Yes. Do they run their affairs? Yes. Is Mali doing the same? Is Niger doing the same thing? So if they are not part of the block of ECOWAS, it doesn't make them illegitimate. If the United Nations does not endorse them as a nation, it doesn't make them illegitimate because the sovereignty of a nation is not tied to its attachment to any international community or the block where they belong to. So these countries are legitimate. And now, to go back, if the people in a country begin to agitate about the government in question, that is when we can say the government is not legitimate, as we, as we may put it. But the people of this particular block have accepted these guys because they believe they came as a solution to their problem that they have been crying for so many years. So I believe that uh, if they work like this for a long period of time and they prove these principles to be truthful, other nations alongside will join. Because this is what France, Germany, European Union tried in 2017 through the G5 Sci Alliance to build a block that will protect the environment for security reasons as well as economic growth, infrastructure and social amenities, they were unable to do for, for from the time they did that till date. Instead, security situations became very complicated, worse, and then the whole of the G5 side area became the most porous environment and the borders were open where groups like Boko Haram, Amrasul, Amurabitum, Al-Qaeda, ISIS were penetrating and causing havoc in those places. At a particular time in 2012, the ancient city of Timbuktu which was confronted by the uh, 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 Amrasu military group, they almost took over. It was the French government that mounted forces and they pushed out the Amrasu group that took over Timbuktu in 2012. Now you realize that with the pact of 2017, the, the tension, the, 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 the insecurity even multiplied. So these guys, if I told this, their pact can be able to redress the situation of insecurity and help each other grow, and then they don't say anything bad with it. And now, Kiki Nome Shudeko, you highlighted on the fact that, uh, or encouraging that this uh, alliance should grow. And uh, we equally understand the fact that many believe that this pack is uh, purposely to fight against the infiltration of France. And uh, if should this, should this uh, alliance grow, what do you think is going to mean to the relationship between uh, you know, the other countries and, of course, France? Uh, are there possibility, or do you see possibilities of the alliance growing with regards to if it's uh, an alliance formed to fight against France's infiltration. Sorry, please, could you repeat the question, the first part of the question? 
Yeah, the question is definitely asking what would this mean, this pack, or what, or how, what are the possibilities of uh, this alliance uh, expanding if we have to consider, because many believe that this uh, alliance is purposely formed to fight against the infiltration of France. We're talking about relationship with France and other nations, and what do you think are the possibilities of this alliance growing if it's, uh, if considering that if it's uh, an alliance formed to fight against uh, France infiltration? Yeah, I think the only way we can say if the alliance is for France is if it's successful against the infiltration of France, right? So, um, like I said, um, uh, the ideas are plenty. We have a lot of ideas. We are people of ideas, right? But the work that is needed to bring about uh, fruits is very, 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 very important. That for me, on the obligation de résultat, right? Right? Instead of obligation de moyen, we have plenty of means. We have, we know exactly, we have all the rules, the policies, the paths, as this case may be, but we don't have results to show for them. So if there is a success, if Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger can categorically say, oh, now, we are free from France's um, um, talk or interest in the country, and we are now ruling ourselves for real, and we are able to build industries, build our people, build the economy, make things better for our people, then it will expand. But as long as this pact is just paperwork to act like we are really against France when we are still doing business on the G with France, you know, because the truth is, these are the people that have been in the countries for so long. These are the people that kind of even know the country so much. They know the kind of people they can talk to to get access to the resources they need. So the question is, is there a back door that still allows these people to do business? Or this pact is just a front to the people to say, oh, yeah, we did a pact. So therefore, you know, France is eliminated forever, you know, if that is what they are trying to say, right? But if there is a success, right, if we already see that we have maybe, for example, an industrial growth, right, that is 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 being galvanized by the people with the fact that they are, they are secured and everything is working for them and people are able to bring in ideas and results, hey, why not? I would even tap into that and want to be part of the pack. And ab above all, you know, the, the critical part of it, which I totally forgot, is what's the content of this pack? What is the content? What is this saying? You know, um, there's a lot of gloss, you know, now that we've called it a pact, you know, and we've say, we say it's called a pact. What is the content of the pact? What are the elements in the pact? That is very, very important for us to note. So one by one, we'll break it apart. Okay, this part of the pact, what is this saying? This part of the pact, just the same way we'll look at our constitution and try to break it into pieces so that we can see the intricacies and look for the court also help us interpret it. So the pact is, what is the sense of the pact that would help us to better understand how to work with this pact? And we, I hope we are together. So basically, first and foremost, what is the content of the pact? And two, if it's successful, even I will tap into it and, you know, and I will say, yeah, they were right and they were able to do this. Thank you. Uh, I like to on the fact that the pack should not just be a paperwork. Uh, Mr. Dr. Mr. Valentine, you started the program by talking about uh, Africa, which has uh, a lot to do when it comes to leadership, that many of what fails in Africa is because of the poor leadership we have. Yes. We're looking at this pack, which equally has to do with uh, leadership. The success of this pack will definitely center around leadership. Do you believe that with the uh, support that the population are giving to the military governments in the different countries, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, uh, will their leadership be able to produce the results that this pact requires? Will uh, it end just at the level of paperwork? We cannot conclude about somebody's leadership prowess until the person is given the opportunity to manifest it. Mm. Leaders are not based on looks. Leaders are not based on structure. Okay. Leaders are not even based on education. Leaders are based on impact. These guys just came into office and we are watching them closely. 
it is too early to make conclusions if they will be able to manage, develop the countries that they took over. Mm. We cannot equally make conclusions now because we are still watching them manage the little power that has been given to them. And nevertheless, they are still under threat because they are nowhere seated in office. They have threats from all angles, from betrayers within the system, from betrayers from the bloc, from betrayers from other countries that can easily influence their downfall. So the guys are sitting on a very hot seat. And you know very well that what they are doing right now is that they are protecting their positions in office, not just working for the growth of the country. So sometimes their attention is diverted towards protecting their seat rather than building their economies. I think when they will have a serene atmosphere that will make them feel comfortable and secured, then by then they will take up economic and political processes that will help build the economy. So to me, I hardly make conclusions on any leader because of what they say. A lot of good speeches have gone across Africa and nothing has been done. I don't make conclusions equally on leaders because people praise them. A lot of persons have been praised by the masses and they came they could not deliver. I don't equally make conclusions on leaders when they just step into office because you cannot understand the aptitude of a leader and his strength until you give him the opportunity because leadership is not explained, leadership is demonstrated. Look at Looking at these guys, they don't have any testimony anywhere where they once walked, where they once carried out activities. They just left the military, overthrew the government in power, and this is the very first time we are seeing them on a stage trying to demonstrate leadership. So it is too early and too, too, too early, I repeat, to make conclusions if they're going to give us the best or not. We have seen persons we never expected to do something substantial. They came up and they did their best. To me, I believe there is still time to watch Asimi Goeta, watch Ibrahim Traore and Abdul Rahman to know if at all military takeover equals to leadership excellence, to know if coup d'etat is a way out in Africa, mm -hmm. to equally know if at all the masses praise you is a sign that you are a competent leader because we have seen all those things manifest in this continent, yet we got the worst out of them. So I think if we are asked the question that are we sure these guys are going to work effectively as leaders, I believe as a political analyst and as a consultant from all ramifications, it is too early to make conclusions on these guys. Let us give them some years to see how they can be able to set up a structure and to drive their economy because we're expecting them to grow in many areas. We're expecting them to grow democratically. We're expecting them to grow economically, socially, infrastructurally, as well as environmentally. We are also expecting them to grow diplomatically. If they're able to give us those qualities as leaders, then we can give a tick, understanding that their works speaks more than their words. We live in a continent where W-R-O-D-S words is more than W-O-R-O-K-S works. A leader is not known by the capacity or the strength of his words. A leader is known by the impact of his works. And I think it's high time we forgot the idea of thinking that because somebody looks good and speaks well, the person is a leader. It's high time we forgot that because somebody occupies an office makes him a leader. Or because somebody cries and pretends to all that he has a poor at heart, we think he's a leader. We have, so many, we have had so many persons in Africa who have come with wonderful manifestos. So I've even written books that convince the masses that this is the man that would turn things around. But unfortunately, when given the opportunity to manage responsibilities, they frustrated everybody. Uh, I take a cue behind the recent, the, 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 the recently ex elected president of Zambia, mm -hmm. President Haikande Hichilema. Mm -hmm. After first tenure in office, he has said he's not coming in for elections again. He must have seen leadership like something that was easy. <laughs> Only when he wore the shoes and realized that sometimes the size of the shoe it's only known when you put it on, not when you look at it. Yeah. So sometimes some shoes appear small, but when you put it inside, your legs enter. Mm. Others may look big outside you where it doesn't go. That's to let you understand that the size of a shoe is not known by its looks. Okay. It's only known by him that puts it on. Mm. So when you wear the shoe of leadership, you will be able to understand the gravity. Let's give the guys who have taken power some time also to prove 
if they are two actually leaders. Mm. Okay, that's a great one. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're looking at equally constraints and uh, we understand that G5 Sahel, of course, did not produce the results and uh, the a military alliance is coming at a time when the relationship between uh, Sahel uh, countries and uh, international community is struggling. But then, we, we equally understand the constraints here and the wish that this alliance should uh, expand. How do you think they are going to fund their resources or their activities when we understand that relationship between them and uh, probably the international community is struggling? Do you see a success in that direction with regards to how they can, you know, support or fund their activities. Will it be possible? Put on your mic. Uh, you might switch on, switch on your microphone, Kikilomo. We can't hear you. Okay. Sorry, apologies. So I'm I'm asking. You're asking how they will fund this. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Now, that's a very good question. Um, now, the truth is this. Um, if you check out all these guys that have been going about this, their cool thing, you notice that they don't look very healthy. So there must be something that had happened in, the, in their camps that led to, apart from, of course, the one that happened in Niger, that's the elite team that actually did that um, coup. But for Mali and Burkina Faso, you notice that these guys are a bit more rugged. You know, they've seen... They've seen a bit of war, so they're a bit more rugged. Niger's uh, military head is is very calm. He's, he's, he's from the elite. He was with the former president till now, and so I guess he wanted to be president and just took over. But for the remaining two, we see how rugged these guys are. So which shows somehow that there is a problem with funding of the military. Now, my question is, since they took over government, has it changed? Has that changed? Has it been adjusted? Um. You know, one thing I know is that um, when military heads take over, at least in the Nigerian context, we know that they generally pump in a lot of money into the military. Sadly, it might not touch the lower cater guys, but the generals, the major generals, they're fine, right? Now, generally, resources, funding is a big issue in Africa. We basically major in minor. We waste a lot of money, right? For those that have money, like my country, Nigeria, we waste a lot of money. We waste the money in the wrong place instead of putting it to impact the right place. Um, we might have the great ideas, but we seem not to know how to fund. And so this question is very critical in the sense that how do they fund this pact? So are we saying there will be an increase in the recruitment of soldiers that will stay in these locations to make it easier? Will the welfare, general welfare of the soldiers be better? Because for me, I'm, I'm very humanitarian in how I look at it. If you're a soldier, if you're a police officer, in any kind of um, um, statutory body or whatever you are, I believe you are still human. Underneath that uniform, the uniform, of course, requires that you be a certain way. But underneath that uniform, you are a human being and you've got a family that you have to cater to. So this pact, it's very, very important that they figure out how to fund. So one of it is that we know that, um, at least for Mali and Burkina Faso, I know France has withdrawn um, the funding that they used to have. And when I, when I saw that news, then I was like, but it's their money in the first place. So why are you making it seem like you're actually doing them a favor, right? But on the other hand, right, the question is the money that is currently in the country, how are they managing it to be able to fund this? Is part of, which is why I asked for the content of the pact. That pact in itself would have who is funding or how it will be funded. And that's the exciting part of it. That pact itself should carry that kind of um, um, information. So if, for example, they would say they begin to donate maybe 100 uh, francs CFA every month to be able to put together the money so that they will be able to use it for the welfare of soldiers, or for the welfare of uh, buying arms and ammunition. That's very. That's a very spectacular question that you asked me. So it is very important that funding comes from all the countries that are involved, and they have to figure out how this funding is supposed to be. So part of it is that they have to fund it to cater to the soldiers that will be in the forefront. That is, those soldiers that will be securing those areas that the pact will be talking about. So as much as 
the pact is great. That pact should also contain um, the funding system. And I think um, funding requires that these, um, these countries that are already struggling with their finances figure out a way to actually fund it. So I expect that the three of them would um, um, have plans to fund it because um, I don't know any other which way they, they might be planning on doing that. But that pact should certainly have that. Those that drew it up for them certainly would have added that element in it. Thank you. Dr. Mbe Valentine, I wanted to get your opinion on that with regards to how you think this, you know, pack could be sustained. We, we understand uh, th these countries are cutting off relationship with France, but many of them have been siding with Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think this will look like? Yeah, you know, one of the challenge, uh, the challenges that uh, these people have had in the past is that they've not been able to manage their resources themselves. Mm -hmm. To the best of my understanding, these countries are rich with natural resources, but those resources do not actually give them the necessary benefits that they deserve. Mm. And because of that, it's part of the grudge that came up that caused them to conduct the coup d'etat so that they could manage their resources themselves. And I think uh, before doing that, they must have had a critical survey and a proper understanding how to manage the resources after the takeover. I don't think funding is going to be a problem this time around because these people are not working only by themselves. Okay. These people work with other international bodies who are also not in alliance with France. You know, there is a divide right now in Europe. There's the East and the West Bloc. And this East and West Bloc is the reason why you see the coup d'etats in Africa. So I believe the other parts of Europe that collaborate with these guys also can help them make their resources produce the benefits that they deserve. They normally say if you see a bird dancing by the roadside, somebody is playing the drum in the bush. This guy's boldness and tenacity and resistance against France is not just an empty exposure of boldness or courage. Mm -hmm. They have somebody playing the drum from behind. And I believe that if these guys are the ones managing their resources, are the ones doing the sales not directly as opposed when France was the intermediary between them and the world market, I think they're going to make much resources. Niger is rich in, di in, in uranium, and Burkina Faso has resources, same as Mali. If these guys trade very well, I think they can make good money. For instance, if you come to Central Africa, there is this bank they call BDAC, Bank de Development de l'Etat de l'Afrique Centrale. It's not BEAC. Mm -hmm. BEAC is a French established institution here that controls and manages our finances in SEMAC. But there is BDAC. This BDAC was formed by the president of Congo, Cameroon, Burkina, um, um, Gabon, Gitura and uh, Gitora, Guinea. Mm. And the headquarter is in Brazzaville, Congo. Mm. This particular bank was set up so that these countries could raise money from those, from their different countries to put in that account to make sure they help in the development of these five countries in the Semak region. The streets and roads were tarred in Pika 14 in Gabon because of Bidiak. Now you realize that Bidia become became very paralyzed and we because the countries could no longer fund. I'm, I'm sure these guys can set up, if not even a bank, a microfinance where they can be saving some income from what they sell abroad to run their affairs there. Because they are going to be contributing definitely on all in order to maintain this park running. Mm -hmm. There's supposed to be support on the military that watches the borders. They're supposed to be on internal security. And I think this pack is not just for military security. It's also going to be for economic and other growth as far as these particular nations are concerned. I believe these guys want to trail a blaze that will cause other, other countries in Africa to see the need of coming together and protecting one another. We lost Gaddafi because he was not supported by any. Mm -hmm. And Museveni Legaron said when Gaddafi was in need of African leaders, there was nobody there to stand with him. I think that if history repeat itself. It's only a sign that I refuse to learn. I believe these guys are doing these things to call the attention to all, the attention of all African presidents to understand that there is a need for them to watch each other's back. Because I think if the 54th state of Africa stood behind Gaddafi when he was invaded by NATO, we would have had Gaddafi still in Africa today. Okay. But because everybody entered into their shell like a snail that has been touched, definitely Gaddafi was left alone to face the catastrophe that came his path. But when these guys start setting this example, it's going to be a, 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 a path that most African countries will follow. So there's a room yeah. that a kilogram of uranium from Niger was sold in the world market for 200 euro. But France was buying it for almost about 0 0.80 euro from the Nigerians, mm. which tells you that France being the intermediary 
between Niger and the world market got almost about 99 percent of their income more than them but if these guys are able now to sell directly i'm sure amount of money should be cut and set aside mm. with the neighboring countries so that they can be able to run their activities mm. these are all blocks in africa we have all these blocks in different different sectors but the blocks cannot fund themselves because individual nations are unable to even manage their own resources that makes it more more dangerous and more critical okay Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ambe Valentine. Uh, Kiki Lomo, you are a risk and security expert. This uh, pack, of course, we, we, it's formed by military uh, governments, and we understand that subsequently, or definitely, they're going to hand over power to, to uh, democratically the elected uh, uh, leader or uh, democratically elected leaders. What do you think about the sustainability of this alliance with in the events of uh, transition from military to uh, uh, civilian government? Do you see this pack working out as it is right now when it concerns military, military with, uh, you know, they understand what their objectives are, but we might not have a civilian, you know, leader understand uh, the need like the militaries are seeing it now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's another good question because certainly we expect that when the transition comes, those ones might throw it out the window and say it's not important to us, right? Um, so for me, that's why I keep saying that these ideas are great, right? But it's very, very important that the content of the pact transitions through the military, if I will put it that way. So how did the military, what's the voice, what's the, how, how has it been put together, right? Um, how has the pact been put together? Is it a kind of pact that the civilian um, transitional government will look at it and say, wow, great idea, great content, or we just, you know, adjust it, you know, and say, okay, the pact is great, but it sounds too, you know, authoritative. Let's adjust it to be a bit more civilian in nature. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? So. For me, yes, um, it could transition into the transitional government. That is, if the pact itself is something that um, is worth the while of that transitional government. But if it is not, I expect it to be thrown out. One, two, generally, generally, um, how the military government always tries to be authoritative and totalitarian in their approach is what causes that things like this are thrown out the window, right? Um, so it is very critical that the current government or whatever they call themselves these days um, figure out how to make that pact transition because it doesn't make any sense that they put all these things in place and by the time a transitional government comes, they think, oh, no, um, it's not, it's not uh, profitable to us because at the end of the day, we know how these leaders become when they take over power, you know. Some might even campaign on it and say, oh, that part, we are keeping it. And when they get into government, they throw it out. So it's very critical that the, the current pack carries that tone for it to transcend periods, you know, for it to transcend governments, right? And so it's because it's so short term, short term. Everything is always so short term with us um, in Africa that um, we kind of do these things and it's a waste at the end of the day. So, for example, let's say this pact works. There's nothing wrong with the transitional government holding on to it and maybe changing the tone as the case may be, but rather than throwing it out. So yes, that it will be basically determined by the government that will be taking over. So if they understand that this pact is of usefulness to their people, if the pact itself, the wordings, how it looks, uh, the content, if it is very much advantageous to their people, then I think the transitional government should consider it and maybe change the tone and adjust it to fit what they are trying to do with their government with fit with their policy and uh, government policy and policies right so um that's what i would say concerning that thank you okay thanks for that uh, kike lomo we go to clearly and uh, dr mevon inside uh, you highlighted france is not giving up anytime soon and we understand the influence that france might have when there was a transitional government in place. Do you see the sustainability of this alliance, you know, working out in the, the near future when uh, there's obviously a transitional government put in place? We understand the influence that France will still have because like you said, and we understand France is not giving up. 
Yes, France is not giving up. Even when France was to leave Mali, the general who headed the military uh, contingent that was in Mali, when interviewed, he said, France is leaving, but France will come back. <laughs> that tells you that France has not given up, and France will not give up anytime mm. soon. They are just looking for waiting. They are for looking for the slightest opportunity, even if it is 50 years to come. They yeah. look for the slightest opportunity to set up another puppet that will heed to their biddings and obey every single order they give from France. Um, talking about this transition government, if the, if this this uh, pack this this yeah. yes, they can sustain the transition. They can. They can. This is because you know Niger is a country that has been characterized by a series of coup d'etats. Mm -hmm. Niger had the first coup d'état in 1974. Then later on in 1996. Then in 1999, Colonel Ibrahim Barry Mainasara conducted another coup d'état in Niger. Then the coup d'état that came in 2010, where you had uh, Bamadou Tamja, and then we had now the 2023 coup d'état that came under uh, Abdurrahman. So Niger has had a series of coup d'états from 1994, 96, 99, 2010, 23, 2023. That is to let you understand that the coup d'état that Why am I giving you this historical background? It's because the coup d'état that took place in the past was for the, was for the interest of France. Okay. Those coup d'etats were conducted when certain individuals wanted to hold tight to the materials, the mineral resources, and protect the interests of their people. So they were ousted by agents sent by France. Mm. This time around, it is not a coup d'etat conducted by France. Because mm. there are many coup d'etats in Africa that have taken place and they were conducted by France. But this time around, the coup d'etat that are coming were not conducted by France, it was conducted against France. So talking about if there's going to be a successful transition, I think those guys who conducted the coup d'etat have a better grip over the system and the administration than any infiltrator. And that's the reason why their primary objective now is that they should oust everything that has to do with France. And the kind of judgment they are going to give on anyone that happens or threatens to operate in fear of France, it will ring a bell in the minds of any other person who is nursing any wicked intentions to bring France back in either of these countries, that there is no space for any betrayer. If you are a betrayer and you come into these countries, the way they will treat you, you will regret. So I believe in the transition, they are going to conduct free and fair elections because first and foremost, I believe that elections are mostly rigged mm -hmm. when, number one, the parliament is in favor of the government that is in question. Number two, when the military is in support. But when the government controls the military and controls the parliament and decides to conduct free and fair elections, there is no board that will manipulate. Most African countries, the military is controlled by the government in question, and secondly, the parliament is controlled by the government in question. So when the parliament endorses and the military defends, you are next president with the backup of external forces. But this time around, the people in question, they are trying to establish a rule of law and to bring back democracy. The issue in Africa is that we have not operated with the rule of law. We have operated ruled by law. Rule of law is when the people choose to make their decisions and equally decide who is going to rule them. But rule by law is when they impose candidates on us and force them to become leaders in our nations. So the rule of law in Africa has been abused because the people who are in power do not give opportunity for the masses to decide. But from what I'm seeing, these guys are working for the common interest of the entire Burkinabes, the Malians, as well as the Nigerians. I strongly, strongly, strongly believe that there is a possibility for them to conduct a transition with successful democratically uh, set up principles that will guide elections to go towards a person who merits it. And they are still there as a watchdog to make sure that if you take power and you want to drift somewhere else, the way they will mix you up, you will not be able to understand mm -hmm. who even brought you into the place of power. Mm -hmm. And those guys, to me, have made up their mind that it's either they save their countries or they die. Mm -hmm. 
because where they are right now is a choice of either this country is redeemed or I die. Mm -hmm. Because the risk they took first and foremost to confront France that has been a threat to most African countries mm -hmm. and how everybody is afraid. It's like somebody confronting the lone giant in a particular community where everybody is running away from. That tells you the height to which these guys are determined to go. My fear is this. Let us not raise strong men through these coup d'etats. Let us raise strong institutions. If these guys actually mean well for their countries, mm -hmm. they should set up institutions that are infallible before leaving power. They should not leave another strong man in power because what they have right now, Asimi Guata is a strong man. Ibrahim Traore is a strong man. Abdul Rahman is a strong man. Thank God we need strong men to be strong institutions. But the legacy these guys have to leave when going out of power should be stronger institutions, not another strong man by like themselves. Mm -hmm. The issue of stronger institutions, it's uh, definitely very important. And uh, we would be interested, equally, to know from you, just uh, as we'll be ending Kikilo Moshideko, the African Union is there like the uh, general overseer of whatever is happening around the, the continent. What do you think can be done by the African Union, or, what, or how can this alliance gain support from you know, other uh, regional organizations or blocks? Well, we have indications that we uh, lost connections with uh, Kikilo Mosholeko. And uh, just to end with you, Dr. Amir Valentine, the African Union is there, the ECOWAS is still in place. These organizations, we understand the African Union is supposed to be the model organization of the African continent. Yet we are still to you know, uh, understand the position of the African Union vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Sahel, and uh, most importantly, intervening in some of the very critical uh, crisis in the uh, in the continent. Do you think the African Union has any role to play with uh, regards to this alliance, and what can they do? A father who sends a child to always go and buy a cigarette will never beat that child if the child starts smoking tomorrow. You become powerless when you are guilty of a crime and you want to judge that same crime. The African Union does not have the effrontery, the African Union does not have that authority to decide on other African countries because African Union has watched other countries play dirty games and they were expected to come in and bring solutions to the problems, but they did nothing. I repeat what Josh Opon Weyer, the Liberian president, said, and I quote, as long as we tolerate constitutional or institutional coup d'etats, there will always be military coup d'etats. The African Union should work hard to make sure that coup d'etats are neither conducted either constitutionally or militarily. The problem we have is that the African Union has celebrated those who conducted coup d'etat constitutionally and they want to raise their voice against those who conduct the coup d'etat militarily. Going to Yaoundé by train, going by aircraft, and going by bus are all means of transport to reach Yaoundé. The most important thing is that you reach Yaoundé. If you conducted a military coup d'etat to rise to power, they should not fight you because they did not fight the person that conducted constitutional coup d'etat to rise to power. We have seen many persons in Africa. I used to think that these things occur only in Africa until I was doing my research and I came, that, came to realize that Franklin Roosevelt in America went for three tenure in office, which was just two. So before you see the democracy of America coming to a balance where you run just for two tenures and you go out, it has taken a lot of rigorous exercise and draconian measures put in place to bring people to the place where they will respect the Constitution. And I think it is very important for African Union to set up protocols on ground that will make people respect their Constitution and respect the guidelines and the rule of laws in their country. As being the overshadowing authority in the continent, and they are not playing their role. They don't expect anybody to respect them. Ask African presidents who are part of the African Union if at all they have any respect for the African Union. The African Union is more of a makeshift tent put in place to cover the impression that there is no governing body in Africa. The African Union is a makeshift tent put in place to convince the world that Africa is united. The African Union is a makeshift tent put in place to make people feel that Africans can make decisions for themselves. That actually speaking, we are as dispersed as grains of corn thrown in a field for planting. 
the African Union has no authority, it doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the moral integrity to sanction any country that conducts constitutional or military coup d'etat because they have allowed people to commit such crimes. How do you explain that a man like Alassane Ramon Ouattara, who by reason of constitutional coup d'etat came to power during a third tenure, is sending forces to go and attack a man that came to power through a military coup d'etat. What's the difference between the thief that stole a bunch of corn, a bunch of plantain, and a thief that stole a bag of corn? They are all thieves. It's just that their products differ. The man that stole power through constitutional coup d'etat and the man that stole through military coup d'etat are all thieves. They have two different products at hand. So they don't have such respect, they don't have moral integrity to judge people for crimes they are equally victims of. And that is where judgment begins, because the judge himself must be justice before he can judge others. Very important. And is there something to add? Well, it's just to let them understand that Africans are behind them, and they are trying to chart a course in Africa that we Africans have been waiting for a very long time. And we pray and give the support that this thing that they have started will help shape this continent Africa and help bring the transition that we need. My challenge to them is that they should not taste power like others and who want to eat. Then they would have spoiled everything that they have fought for. They should be the role model that the Africans are looking up to. Let them set up stronger institutions and don't raise or remain strong men. Okay. Set up stronger institutions and be the role models that Africans are looking up to. Uh, Dr. May Valentine, thank you very much. We, we're glad to have you on today's program. Thanks very much for your analysis and your discussions. We equally want to appreciate Kikilo Meshuneko, RIGS um, and security uh, experts. You were there on Zoom from Nigeria. Thank you very much. Dr. May Valentine, you are uh, an economic and political consultant. It's a pleasure having you, and welcome back. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Luis. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and we were looking at the uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger military alliance, which was formed recently, and its impact in the fight against insecurity in the Sahel region. And just like you've uh, followed up from uh, experts here in the studio, we are hoping to join you again subsequently to discuss more on how the alliance is going, and uh, of course. Uh, we just want to invite you to stay tuned to more programs on Africa Media. It was a wonderful pleasure, and thanks to our technicians who did a wonderful job. Until we meet again, it's a bye bye for now. Stay with us. Africa Media. Le monde, c'est nous.